And if there's one thing I really want you guys to take away is that you are going to get into medical school being who you are, because being genuinely you is going to appeal to both your patients and your colleagues and the people that are reading your application for medical school. Hey everybody, glad to see that you come across this video. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Velasquez and I'm a pre-medical student at the University of North Texas. I was able to bring a friend of mine from Phoenix, Arizona, who's currently a second year medical student and he's uh, willing to share a couple words of advice for you all. Hope you enjoy. All of us are here from my understanding is that we want to get into medical school, right? So there's a lot of information out there about how to exactly get into medical school. And a lot of it is usually pretty good, but sometimes the sense that I get from certain people is that they let a lot of anxiety speak for them as well. So if you talk to certain people, they'll be like, oh, you need to do X, Y, Z and do it in this order and do it at this time frame. And this is how, like, this is the exact formula for getting into medical school. And in some cases, maybe this is a little bit true, but in other cases, this doesn't exactly follow through in the same way. I'm speaking about this in the capacity that I'm also an ambassador at my medical school for the admissions department, which means that I help interview people. I help the admissions committee uh, review some applicants uh, full application. So I'm really in tune with what medical schools usually like to look with. Um, a lot of this, I will say, might be subject to change because there's actually been a lot of changes happening in medical education, if you guys haven't noticed. Step one, complex one are both turning into pass fail. Uh, the merger of the residencies is another major change. And from what I've heard some, from some of the backroom talk is that there's other major changes coming along the way, but I, I won't go into too, much, too many details with that. So with that being said, now we need to think about how is the, what is your path to medical school going to look like, okay? So to give you an idea for me, I graduated from UTD in uh, 2016 with my bachelor's in neuroscience. I took a year off. Let me close my door a little bit. <laughs> I was working in the emergency department for about a year as a patient care technician. Then I got into my graduate school program at Brown, went there, finished my master's, in about a year came back to Dallas and I worked in a dental clinic for a So there's a lot of different routes to getting into medical school. And I was kind of just explaining my route was pretty non-traditional. I graduated from my undergrad in 2016 and I ended up getting into medical school in 2019. I'm a current second year at my medical school. Um, so people usually call that a non-traditional student. And I would probably argue that non-traditional students are becoming more and more and more common in most medical schools, because you have to think about it like this. When an admissions committee gets your application, the core question they are asking themselves and each other is, do we trust this person to be a doctor? Is this person gonna be someone that we, would, we ourselves would go to in the future to seek medical care and trust essentially with our lives, right? So. That's the core issue that a lot of these committees really try to struggle with about how do they screen applicants for these values and these experiences and for this potential overall to become a physician at the end of the day. So they're looking at a lot of different things. And I think the one really important thing to know about applying to medical school is that you want to apply as an adult, right? And you want to kind of craft your entire application making yourself sound as adult as you possibly can. Now, from what I can kind of tell just by looking at some of y'all's faces is there's a bit of a range in what, uh, what age some of y'all might have been, what y'all have might have experienced in your own personal lives, so on and so forth. And I don't want to get too hung up on the whole age thing because a whole range of people get into medical school from anywhere between 21 years old to the oldest guy in my class is 45 years old. So, um, at the end of the day, what the admissions committees are really asking you by looking at your application is, is this person mature enough to say, give a terminal diagnosis to someone that now has stage four breast cancer? Okay, I'll tell you guys a little story as I'm here. So my first week starting my clinical rotations was in family medicine. And the very first patient I saw was a, I'm kind of changing up the details as I go 
to, for HIPAA reasons, um, was a 35 year old female with abdominal pain. My family doc was like, okay, go see her, take a full history, do your abdominal exam, report back to me, see what you think. I'm like, okay. So first patient, I was a little nervous. I go in there, introduce myself. Hi, my name is Sean Hall, I'm a second year uh, medical student. Heard you have some abdominal pain going on. I'd like to hear in your own words, what's going on? And she says, yeah, hi, nice to meet you. Pulls out her phone immediately, pulls up a picture and says, is this a hemorrhoid? Well, it's not exactly how I predicted my first clinical encounter to go, but you know, here I was. So a couple minutes later, I'm looking at the pictures and I say, well, I can't really determine. Uh, this is hard to tell, could be a skin tag, could be something else. Um, so why don't we just, you know, when we get to the physical exam, we can talk about whether we wanna, you know, include a rectal exam in this as well. And she was like, no, 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 no. This is actually my boyfriend's. And I was like, oh, okay. So obviously this is not exactly how I would have expected my first clinical encounter to start, but you have to be adaptive. This is how real people act, obviously. So we finally get into her story. She explains to me what's going on with her abdominal pain. It's, it appears pretty psychogenic. Um, a lot of people, especially now with the pandemic, are coming in with uh, IBS type of symptoms with general abdominal pain and nausea and all that stuff. But part way through the encounter, she actually starts crying all of a sudden. And I thought we were being really cordial. I thought we were getting along really well. The start of the encounter was pretty interesting. But as I'm doing my abdominal exam and checking everything out and all the quadrants and all that, she just starts crying. So you kind of have to step back and be like, this clinical encounter is anything but your standard clinical encounter. So how would you deal with this patient? You know, most people would clam up and I kind of clammed up for a bit too. But you have to kind of step back and be like, okay, this 35 year old female with abdominal pain is crying suddenly. What do I do? Okay. So that's one story I want you guys to kind of think about as we're going through this. So when it goes to crafting your entire application around the idea of trying to make yourself come to be, uh, bring out yourself as like a mature candidate for medical school, you have to think about certain things that you want to do to make it look like that, right? So a lot of people will be like, okay, you have to have good grades. You have to have good MCAT. Those two things, I would agree, very important. But I think a fundamental misunderstanding a lot of people have is those two things are the only things you will need to get into medical school. And I will tell you that is so far from the truth. I, I, I can't stand it when people say that. Take it from, I, I listened to an interview given by the admissions director from Stanford Medical School. She was a physician. Um, her name is blanking on me right now, but she, I'm kind of paraphrasing here when she said, saying a applicant is qualified to be a physician based on their GPA and their MCAT is equivalent to saying someone is qualified to run a marathon because they have a pair of legs. Now I have a pair of legs. Does that mean I'm qualified to run a marathon? No. All right. I'm sure most who here has a pair of legs as well. Yeah. Who here thinks they're qualified to run a marathon right now? No. So, and this is coming from Stanford's medical school. Okay. So anyone that tells you the only way to get into medical school, GPA, MCAT, that's not true. GPA, MCAT starts to open the door to medical school. So that's the way you kind of want to think about it. Certain schools will have a cutoff. This is true. Uh, UT Southwestern is a big one that usually has a cutoff. Um, I'm not sure if TCOM is. Uh, a number of other medical schools in Texas as well also have a cutoff. But um, going from that, uh, let me see what I want to say. There are other things that you can do that will really start to open that door into getting you an interview, which is your true, true step into actually getting you into medical school. When a program, when a medical school program invites you for an interview, they want to make sure that they can actually trust the person that's sitting there in the room with them or in the Zoom room with them to make sure that they're actually qualified to be a doctor. So other things you can do to really start to open that door. 
your personal statement. P- people really underestimate how important your personal statement is. And they also really underestimate how much time they have to put into a personal statement. And they underestimate what it means to write your personal statement. So you have to think about it like this. Everything you do when you're applying to medical school is a game of perception. Your What the program perceives as you is going to determine whether you get invited to an interview and then one is going to determine what gets you an acceptance or a rejection from that school. Okay. And the very first thing any medical school really sees that tells you exactly who you are to the committee is your personal statement. That's like your cover letter. So it needs to be perfect. So anytime I talk to a fourth year that's asking me, okay, I'm starting to write my um, personal statement. What do I do? I tell them, first thing you're going to ask yourself, look yourself in the mirror. And I'm, I'm being 100% serious with this. Look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, why are you alive? Why do you wake up each morning? And why is it related to medicine? Once you can start to answer that question, then you can start to write your personal statement. A lot of people start writing their personal statements and they're like, when I grew up, my mom had this health, health condition and it made me feel bad. And then that's when I realized I wanted to be a doc. Don't do that. Please don't do that. I've read so many personal statements and it always starts with some family condition. And there's a way you can talk about family commissions, conditions. If it really did truly have an impact on you, please talk about it. But I've read so many where it's like, this is how what happened to me in my family made me feel bad. And this is why I wanted to be a doctor. Don't just do that. Okay. That's not how you're going to get into medical school. You're writing this personal statement as an adult. And there are certain things you can do in the personal statement and in the interview to make yourself look like an adult. Okay. So think about that when you're writing the personal statement. Again, start with the question, why am I alive? Why do I wake up each morning? Okay, what gets me going each day? Why do I try so dang hard in undergrad to go to medical school eventually? Right, why is it all worth it? Once you can start to answer that, then you can start to work on your personal statement. And to give you guys an idea, I went through about eight or nine drafts for my personal statement until it was actually ready for submission to the medical schools. Took me a long time to actually write that personal statement. But, but now this is key. I got eight interviews to medical school. I attended six of them. Three out of six of them, each of my one-on-one interviews all said something really good about my personal statement. Uh, The University of Colorado, the medical school in Denver, um, as soon as the physician approached me, he was like, Sean Halbeck, oh, I'm, I've really been looking forward to this. I, can't, I read your personal statement. I thought it was really interesting. I wanted to ask you some questions about this, this, and that. And I'm really looking forward to that interview, to, uh, to us t- to talk. The whole interview was basically set for me. I didn't have to really tell them why I wanted to be a doctor. They knew exactly why I wanted to be a doctor because I said it in my personal statement. So the rest of the interview that was about 20 minutes long was basically just a conversation about my life. And when you start an interview like that, that is incredibly powerful. So you want that advantage, okay? You really, really want to give yourself that advantage because once you start the interview, especially when it's your very first interview, that one in Denver for me was my first. I was nervous. I was very nervous. But once that person walked up to me and was like, I'm looking forward to talking to you, that just completely changed my mindset for the rest of the interview. I felt so confident. Our conversation was completely natural. It was just amazing. So I want you guys to also have that benefit once you get to your interviews. Okay. So that's another thing you can do to start to really open that door to getting your first interview into medical school. Your personal statement is very, very key. What I think, what I personally think is becoming more and more important is going to be your rec letters as well. So a lot of people always ask, okay, who do I get from my rec letters? There's a lot of good answers to this, and there's a lot of okay-ish answers to this as well. So first of all, most medical schools are going to ask for one physician and one uh, 
professor from one of your like undergraduate or graduate level classes. So you're gonna have to have two of those. For your physician letter, try to get someone that you really, really vibe with, whether you work in the emergency room as a scribe or you work at like a primary care clinic as like an MA, whatever you do in the clinical setting with a doctor, get someone that you really, really vibe with. Don't just get the first physician you can find. Try to find someone that really like gets you, okay? Now for your professor letter, probably the same advice I'd probably give for the physician letter. Get someone who really understands you. My personal, uh, my professor letter was someone I worked with as a peer tutor for organic chemistry for about three years. She was my advisor in the chemistry department and we just completely got each other. And I know she wrote me a fantastic letter because interviews also talked about, hey, you had some really good letters. Again, another thing that makes you feel really good to hear in an interview. And I want you guys to also feel that, okay? So get a good letter from them. You can go all the way up to about five letters for medical school, okay? Now, um, what you feel with the other three or so letters is kind of up to you. To give you an example of what I filled it with is I used my graduate school program director at Brown. I used my martial arts uh, sensei. Uh, I do kendo. I've done kendo for about 10 years, 10 years or so. And I had one of my sensei from the martial arts dojo write me one. And then my, um, my last one was a second physician letter. Uh, that's because I found someone in my graduate school program that I thought really liked me and he offered to write me a letter or so. Uh, that, that's someone else you can also fill it with. So try to get people that have also seen you grow. I, I, I approached my martial arts instructor because he saw me start undergrad and he saw me journey all the way up until I got accepted into medical school. He saw me change a lot and I knew he knew who I was. So try to find, try to think about who that person might be for you. Okay. Um, so rec letters are really, really important. Um, kind of moving on. I'm going to take a quick look at the chat just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is something I also want to talk about with y'all. So because y'all go to UNT, you have the somewhat advantage that um, TCOM will look at y'all's applications a bit, a little bit more favorably from my understanding. Um, so the question now becomes with UNT, TCOM uh, being one of the only DO schools in Texas, some of you might be wondering why did I personally also choose to go to a DO program? And there are, are a lot of good answers to this, but it will definitely vary from person to person. Um, I got a glowing recommendation. The very first time I heard about an osteopathic medical school was from a retired pediatric neurologist who was the professor of my neuroanatomy class at, um, at UTD. And he gave a glowing recommend recommendation that we should all try to, we should all highly consider applying to DCOM. From there and so forth, um, I started to kind of slowly discover what it meant to be a DO and what does the osteopathic manipulative medicine mean? What does it mean to think like a DO? Um, so to give you guys just a real quick summary about this, because I feel like I could, take a, I could spend a lot of time with this, is that um, there are some serious benefits to some of the manipulative therapy, depending on what field you're gonna end up going to. So I'd give a high recommendation to consider an osteopathic program if one, you're interested in family medicine, uh, PMNR, and sports medicine. Those fields are very, look very, very favorably, favorably to uh, osteopathic physicians um, because of the manipulative medicine, especially PMNR and especially sports medicine. Those two absolutely love them. Um, so to kind of give you guys a very broad description of what the manipulation is, is the manipulation is basically when you work with the soft tissue of the body to kind of help it facilitate the healing of the tissues. Um, to give you guys an example of what I did in clinic once, uh, I had a 21 year old with the Curvain's tenosynovitis, which is basically inflammation of this tendon right here that controls your thumb. Um, she had this problem 
for a couple months after she injured, injured it while she was lifting weights at the gym. So I did some soft tissue uh, uh, manipulative medicine uh, techniques on her. And she said her pain in office effectively went from a 10 out of 10 to a, about a five out of 10. And she kept coming back to see me on the same day that I was there because she said, whatever you did to me has dramatically improved the swelling, the pain that I had in that uh, tendon. So I'm going to keep coming in on Thursday so I could see you basically. So that's kind of in a, that's in a very broad sense, what the manipulative medicine is. So I think some of you are saying, is it a bit basically uh, pain management? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Okay. Um, now, I'm uh, just quickly reading over some of your comments just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, how long should the personal statement be? You'll get to that once you actually get to your fourth year, whenever you decide to um, apply for uh, medical school. It's roughly two pages, but again, I wouldn't worry about how long your personal statement is. Right now, you want to really figure out why, what is going to actually go into your personal statement. Then once you actually write it, you can trim it down and figure out like what are the real key details you want to come across with your personal statement. Um, so yes, pain management is one of the big benefits for OMM. Uh, okay, cool. So it looks like I got all the answers. Um, any other questions while I'm kind of compiling my thoughts a little bit? Anything at all? And feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you want to ask in person. Hi, I have a question. So um, you said that you had revised your personal statement uh, like roughly nine times before you felt it was acceptable to submit to um, uh, like a medical school. My question was, did you ever have it uh, revised by anyone else? Yes, okay. yes, and that's very important. Get someone you highly trust, someone that knows you very, very well to revise it. You kind of, you might want to prefer to gear it towards uh, someone that's also in the medical community so they kind of know where you're coming from, from your personal statement. I would also kind of recommend, give it to someone who's extremely good at grammar that might not necessarily also be in the medical community. Um, because you kind of also want to get a sense of like, what is a lay person, you know, what is like a non uh, clinician, a non healthcare provider going to think about this? Because a lot of the people in the admissions committees as well might also not be healthcare providers. So you want to make sure that someone that's not in the clinical field and knows exactly what you're talking about can understand why you want to be a physician for meeting your personal statement as well. Okay. And a big benefit if you're able to get someone that, you know, is really good with grammar, is really good with phrasing and all that stuff to really clean up your essay, to make it look as perfect as you really can have it, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions while, I'm, while we're here? So do you think OMM could replace um, the use of opioids and narcotics? And do you think um, OMM could help those addicts um, who are like ad addicted to opioids do you think OMM could help with that? Oh, yeah, 100%. I think there's a lot of potential for it to be used through continuation of care for people with, like, on pain management. If you guys did not, weren't also aware, pain management is its own growing field within the medical community. And it is very, very important uh, that it continues to grow because obviously this entire country and the entire world has a pain problem. So, OMM, yes, can be used for pain management purposes. Um, TCOM, when I went there for one of their open houses, uh, they have this really, really cool clinic uh, attached to TCOM that's basically a, um, I think it was an alcohol and opiate withdrawal clinic. But their, their kind of shtick was that they didn't use any medications to help them come through the withdrawals of alcohol and opiates. They used... Um, like religious therapy, spir spiritual therapy. They got all kinds of religious leaders from the community. And I thought that was so cool. And they also had the, um, the clinicians that taught at, uh, at a TCOM that practice in OMM come there and help them do their course of their pain, through the painful withdrawal. So that's something that you guys can keep in mind as well. So there, are, there is a lot of potential with OMM to use. 
I'm, to give you an idea, I'm personally very, very interested in psychiatry. And I, I think I'm probably going to be using my OMM skills and techniques in, um, in my psychiatry practice. That's what I'm heavily considering as well. So there's a lot of potential for it. Because at the end of the day, think about it like this. The OMM is another tool in your vast toolbox for how to help your patients. And I know some people, you know, give it, you know, a lot of crap. And some, maybe sometimes it does deserve to get a little bit of the crap. But at the end of the day, putting your hands on the patient is the most important part of the OMM procedures. I can't tell you how many times patients have suddenly just opened up to me and said all kinds of just game-changing things and things I didn't know, things I didn't realize from our, our, our history that I was taking with them. Just when I was doing this, these simple procedures, these simple manipulative techniques, um, just through that. Patients really, really appreciate it. If you just, if it feels like you're taking the time out of your schedule to put your hands on them, see if you can figure out what's going on in that way. It truly, I personally believe, obviously I'm not biased, but I truly believe it's like the healing hands of medicine. It really goes Thank a you. long way for our patients. Okay. Any other questions? Um, hi, Sean. I had a question. Um, I wanted to know more about your experience as a med school student. Um, let's say a, a bad, stressful day, a good day, um, the balance overall. This is an excellent question. And I was probably going to transition into this if someone didn't already ask me. So thank you for asking this. Um, if you asked me about a year ago, I probably wouldn't be giving you the same answer that I am now. And I'm mostly saying that because of, uh, let, me, let me restart this, let me reframe this. In the past two months, I've personally heard of three medical school students, one of them attached to my school, one of them upperclassmen that commit suicide, okay? This is medicine's big dirty secret. Some of you might know that it's not a dirty secret and it's plainly obvious to you and props to you for that. But some of you might not realize physician suicide rate, resident suicide rate, medical school suicide rate is outstandingly high. It's ridiculously high. It's way more than it should be. And that's because there is a lot of problems in medical education. It is quite frankly, a bit dehumanizing sometimes. So I'm not sugarcoating it for y'all, okay? So the question is, how do we deal with that? There's a lot of different answers to this and it, it gets a bit complex, but also simple at the same time. It's complex in that you as pre-meds are still trying to work really hard to get into medical school. So you gotta do a lot of different things to get into medical school. And what I'm really trying to get y'all to leave here today with is that you don't need to sacrifice who you are to get into medical school. In fact, who you are is how you should get into medical school. I can't tell you how many classmates in undergrad completely burn themselves out or completely change who they are and be honestly become, and pardon my harsh language a bit, but they become complete degenerates sometimes because they're trying to get into medical school. And if there's one thing I really want you guys to take away is that you are going to get into medical school being who you are, because being genuinely you is going to appeal to both your patients and your colleagues and the people that are reading your application for medical school. You're going to be very miserable if you don't get into, med if you get into medical school not being who you are. Okay, and I know this sounds kind of floofy sometimes, but you have to do certain things like self-care has to be your number one priority. I'm in my second year of medical school. In two months, I'm going to be taking two board exams in the course of two ex weeks. According to everyone that I've ever talked to, these two exams effectively determine where I'm going to residency. I've talked to classmate after classmate in my capacity as a peer tutor a lot of people are getting really stressed out because of this. One classmate developed a, 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 a stress ulcer because of this. Another one told me that she just got diagnosed with IBS by her primary care physician. 
But another one had to take a year off because she was in such a bad psychological state. She just had to take completely the entire year off. And if you talk to anyone that's in medical school, this unfortunately is a common theme. But on the bright side, there are ways to still combat that. Again, going back to this, self-care should be your number one priority. Yes, obviously. Yes, definitely. Stress can weaken your immune system. Chronic stress can weaken your immune system very specifically. Um, so uh, what was I saying? So there are ways to definitely combat this. And I don't want to get too off topic, topic because this is maybe something I'm thinking about as the current medical student, but there are still ways as as y'all are for as pre-meds to really combat that. So obviously I want you guys to still think about like, what are the things that make you happy? I, I, love, my, I love my martial arts. So that was always a key uh, stress reliever for me. I fundamentally believe I wouldn't be the who I am if I didn't have my martial arts, okay? I love to play video games. I love to read books. I love to listen to audiobooks. I love to listen to YouTube videos about philosophy. That's who I was. And I always focused on these activities, these hobbies first before my studies. Because the way I've always thought about it is you are a good student if you are in the right frame of mind to study. So put yourself in that frame of mind by giving yourself breaks. Okay. A lot of my classmates, unfortunately, study 12 hours a day from when they wake up at 6 a.m. till when they go to bed at whenever they go to bed, okay? And it's really just sad for me to see them just deteriorate over time as they, as they put, them through, put themselves through that sort of process. And I don't want you all to do that, especially not before you even get into medical school. Can't tell you how many people, again, that have pre-burnt out before they even get into medical school. I wanna avoid all burnouts in general. So not getting burnt out in the first place in pre-med is the first step to that. Once you get into medical school, then we can talk about other techniques and other ideas, other study strategies, all kinds of stuff to make sure you also don't hopefully get burnt out in medical school. Okay, I think we had another question. I did. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So I was writing my personal statement and I found that I was putting in a lot of my personal experiences and not as much of who I was, but I would, I wrote it like an essay, like a typical lab report essay. It was like, this is who I am. And these are the credentials that give me that. It was, it was terrible. I felt like um, I was writing a lab report. So I know that there's a separate section on the, um, I guess, application where you put in all that information. Is it good to repeat it? I wonder. I don't know. You, you can, exp I wouldn't say you should repeat it. I would more, I'd prefer to say you should expand on it if it plays into the overall theme you have in your entire application and in your personal statement about why physician. If you're just sitting there going paragraph by paragraph in your personal statement, and then I volunteered at this clinic and I had this patient and so on and so on forth about, um, if you're just listing out your resume on your personal statement, that's a big no-no, don't do that. If you're gonna be talking about certain experiences you've already put on your TMDSAS or your AMCAS application, whatever application you end up doing, um, you want to expand on it. Why is it important? What did you learn from it? How did it make you feel? And ultimately, why is it going to play into the fact that you want to be a doctor or how is it going to play into the fact about how you're going to be a good doctor in the future? It's all about that like overarching theme because keep in mind, the personal statement is 100% answering the question, why medicine? Why do you want to be a physician? A lot of people just think that the answer is I want to help people. And, and that's, a, that's, a fine, I, that's a somewhat fine answer. But if you want to help people, why don't you become a dietitian? Why don't you become a physical therapist? Why don't you become a nurse? Nurses do a lot more than physicians, I'd argue. 
why physician then? Very specific question. In about two of the six interviews I had, they very specifically asked me, why physician? Not my medicine, why physician? And they added a qualifier, why not nurse? Why not dietitian? Why not PT? You know, everything else. And you have to think about why physician for yourself as well. Okay. Was there another question? Yes. GB. I have a question. Um, so you were talking about earlier that you got your recommendation letters from a phys like some of your physicians that you had worked with and things like that. Um, when hearing about recommendation letters, I've always heard that the doctor slash physician that you get your recommendation letter from should be a physician in the specific field you want to be in. Um, how true is that? How much does that affect your recommendation letter? Because hearing what you said, like brought a physician to my mind that I've been working with for a long time, but he's not necessarily in the field that I want to be in. And I, I also want to go to DO medical school. And so, but he's not a DO doctor himself. And I understand that DO recommendation letter is very important or in highly recommended. So I just wanted to know, like, the impact of the qualification of the people you get your uh, recommendation letters from? Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, so to kind of answer the DO part, because it feels like a bit of a two-part question, um, most DO medical schools, including myself, have the qualifier that they strongly prefer you to have a DO physician to write you a letter. Now, that being said, I know multiple classmates of mine that have gotten into my medical school without a DO letter. So it is possible for you to still get that interview and acceptance without a DL letter, but it would strongly benefit you, I would say, if you have that DL letter. Now, the first part of the question, um, so, so say right now you're thinking you wanna go into emergency medicine. Will you hurt yourself if you get a family medicine doctor to write you a letter? I do not think so. No, I do not think so. Because at the end of the day, what they hopefully put on your letter are qualities. They're going to hopefully write about qualities that make you a good physician in general, right? Sometimes a pitfall some people might make when applying to medical school is they might pigeonhole themselves into one specific specialty. And some, for some of those cases, that might end up being the specialty you practice in, which is totally cool if it works out like that. But certain other cases, it might not actually help you as much as you think, okay? So I think a bit of a broad advice I'd say is don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself in that way. And don't think that if you want to go into surgery and you get a a pediatrician to write you a letter for medical school, that's going to hurt you. That's not going to hurt you. That'll, that'll probably help you assuming they write you a good letter, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really quickly want to answer Adam's uh, question. Aren't grades for medical students even more important now that some of the exams have switched to pass fail? So you have preclinical exams, uh, which I have a final for tomorrow. Um, that you take while you're going through like the Oregon systems in your first and your second year. When you look at the NRMP, which is a big database for all the residency directors, what they're looking for in residence, they always list like what's the most important thing to all the way what's the least important thing. And I kid you not, the, can very consistently at near the bottom of the list is your preclinical grades. And to go even further into that, many medical schools are transitioning into also having pass fails on their preclinical exams. So the grades you kind of want to be more concerned about are going to be your clinical grades, because once you're in third and fourth year, you're going to start getting assessments from the physicians you work with, as well as a shelf exams you have to take after each of your rotations that show how good or bad you are in each of the different fields yes, will probably become more important. But if you ask me, in my opinion, I think 
that's at least better than the pre what we previously had, because at least these exams and these assessments from the physicians are testing you on how good, you, how well you know that clinical knowledge, the stuff that actually applies to um, patient care. A lot of what you learn in first and second year doesn't really necessarily translate to patient care. I can't tell you how many times I've learned about tetanus in the first two years of medical school and go ahead and look up the stats for yearly tetanus diagnoses in the country. It's like single digit, single digits. I guarantee I'm never going to see tetanus, but I've learned it so many times. Okay. So that's kind of indirectly answering that question. Um, and I did have multiple questions. Uh, I could just ask for like a, not an in-depth answer if that's uh, good for time, Mark, would that be okay? Also, okay. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put my email um, in the chat. If you guys wanted to establish a more long-term relationship, go ahead and feel free to email me there. Um, I'll get your phone number as well. We can start texting. We can set up other meetings. So if you have like further questions that you think might not necessarily apply to everyone else, you can go ahead and feel free to email me at that email. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I would like to say my condolences for your uh, friend's passing as well. Um, but I know earlier in your uh, talk, you mentioned how we need to have like a mirror self-talk and kind of figure out why, like, what is my purpose in life and why does it relate to medicine? And uh, would shadowing or getting clinical experience kind of showcase that this is what we define as our purpose in life and how it entangles with medicine because it shows like a track record of actually acting on our purpose, so to speak? Yes, that, that, would, that would certainly help. To give you guys the kind of the quick, hopefully the quick story about what happened with me. Um, one of my best friends, he sat me down and he said he had already got accepted to many fantastic medical schools and he was really helping me with my application as well. He sat me down and he asked me this question which is why I'm in turn asking y'all, why are you alive? Why do you wake up each morning? What keeps you going? And at first I thought I had an answer to that, but the more I thought about it, the more I felt like I had a bit of a mini existential crisis when I thought, man, I, I don't actually a hundred percent know. I can't like answer that with the absolute certainty that I feel like I need, right? And I feel like what end up actually really helping me answer that question was, I always think about this one gentleman I met in graduate school when I was working at a community health center. Um, I went to this meeting for a bunch of uh, previously incarcerated individuals and they were at the community health center trying to figure out like the resources that the community health center had, how they could, um, you know, make their health better. Like what uh, resources, what uh, programs, outreach programs do they also have? like all these different things that could really help these people that just recently got out of prison that are now trying to reintegrate themselves into society. And I sat next to this one guy and I decided to strike up a conversation with him. And I'll never forget this. Um, this guy said, I'm not even just here for myself. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not even just here for myself. I'm here for my friend who doesn't have legs and doesn't have a means of transportation. I want to make my life better now. I want to, you know, make something with my life. And I thought that was, this guy recently came out of prison. He told me that his offense was that multiple drug felonies, multiple assault charges, all kinds of stuff. And he said, I've decided I want to make something of my life now. I want to be a better person. I want to be healthy. And this, this is what really just shook me up a bit. And I want to do it for my friend who can't be here. And I thought that was like one of the most incredible things. Like I'm just starting to like tear up thinking about it. I thought to myself, that guy would be an excellent physician. How can I be more like that guy? So I thought to myself, what is my purpose then? My purpose is to elevate people. And I, that's, that's, what, that's kind of the theme that I had for my entire application. I want to bring people up. I want to see if I can bring them to their fullest potential. That is my purpose for why I want to be a physician. That is why I want to be a psychiatrist. I want to work with people in their most vulnerable states and see how I can bring them up to a better place. That is exactly why I'm here. 
okay? And why I'm now talking to all of y'all is I want you to find that purpose. And if you find that purpose and it truly does align with medical school, I want you to dive right into it and be passionate about it because that's how you're going to stave off the burnout, the burnout rates that they talk about is outstandingly high with all the physicians. That's how you're going to fight it. You be passionate. You get excited for the future. You get excited to help all your future patients. That's what's going to keep you so driven. And that's why I keep talking to pre-meds and high school students. I want you guys to find that for yourselves. And I hope it'll end up being in a clinical setting. I hope it'll end, end up with you in a clinical setting, I should say. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does actually. Um, thank you for your time and my condolences again. Okay, any more questions? Let me quickly read the chat. Yeah, I think Karen had a question. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, so I've always heard that for your medical school resumes, you should always include um, extracurricular activities and leadership positions as well as volunteer work and affiliations that you've had with other organizations. Um, in your experience, what were some of the things you're a part of um, that you added to your resume and helped you build it up? Sometimes I feel like people build a resume. I don't want to say this. Sometimes people think about their CV and their resume and they're like, how can I make this bad boy as thick as possible? I mean, like thick, like how, how many pages can I really add to it? That's not entirely necessary. When it, when it comes to really adding these like leadership experiences and all these other experiences, at the end of the day, it's really the stuff that keeps you driven. Some of the leadership experiences I had was that I was the co-founder of the Kendall Club at UTD. And I loved that club. I poured so much time into it. I got super excited each time I talked about it. It gave me all kinds of opportunities to teach my fellow undergraduate students about some of the fundamental principles of Kendo and why it's a great martial art. Um, in my research lab, I got to work with people that were uh, younger with me in my undergrad. I got to show them like why this research was important, what like the techniques were for the rodent surgeries that we did, how can we make these uh, rodents like last as long as possible? So I'm, I'm trying to kind of keep this answer short because we're running uh, short on time. You will find leadership opportunities to fill your resume as long as you stay true to your purpose. And I know that sounds super cliche, but it's 100% true. What, again, coming back to the question, what keeps you going each day? What wakes you up in the morning? What do you get super excited about? What leadership opportunities do you get super excited about? That's the type of, that's the type of stuff you put on your application that it'll follow through when you're actually interviewing at a medical school and they'll be like, oh, I saw you were the co-founder of this club. Can you tell me about the process of getting people to get uh, motivated in this club? It's like, yes, I can't wait to answer this question. That's what you wanna do with your leadership roles. I have another question. Um, so could be, could um, wanting to be a physician because I don't really see minorities as physicians, could that be a good reason for being a physician? Um, yeah. That could 100% play into your overall theme for why you want mm -hmm. to be a physician. So if you grew up in an underserved area that yep. say didn't have too many physicians of your ethnicity, of your culture, that yeah. could definitely play into that. Because um, uh, I'm, I'm from Fort Worth, and, and um, so we have like a high population of Hispanic people there, and I don't really see doctors who speak Spanish, and patients can't really communicate with doctors, like they always need a translator, so that's like a, a, one of my reasons, but I just wanted to know if that's like a good reason. Yes, I, I think that's, that could certainly be a good reason. Now, what you could now think about doing, um, I don't know what year you are, but if you're early on first year, you're a freshman? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So you can start, start thinking about how exactly do you want to like sort of theme your application surrounding that core principle. So you grew up in an area, you didn't see very many physicians that spoke Spanish, 
and thus there was an underserved community that wasn't able to effectively communicate their concerns to a physician that, understand their, that understands their culture, their language, obviously, mm. and like their entire background, right? So you can put yourself in certain experiences, like certain clinics say that might, not, might lack a Spanish speaker, say, see if you can volunteer there, be a translator for them. See if, as you're shadowing, see if you can offer your translating services to them as well. Yeah. Just do things within your community that really builds along this entire principle that I can already tell you're very passionate about. And once you do that, that'll, that'll go over really, really well in the admissions committees because they'll be like, well, wow, this guy has made it his goal, his drive to really supply a community with a physician that understands their language and culture. And they will be very, very attracted to that and really appreciate that. I can guarantee you that. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna cut in just a little bit. Um, I know it's about 5.59, but I'm gonna send you all the attendance link right here. This is how we're gonna keep track that y'all showed up today. Um, but yeah, we're gonna just continue with our questions uh, or with our Q and A. So um, I believe Betsy was next. Yes, I just had um, a quick question. So I know that you were talking about um, asking yourself, like, why are you alive? Why are you here? Which comes in intact with, like, why do you want to be a physician? Do you have, like, an idea of how can we stay true to ourselves while we're in, in the interview without being so, like, nervous, without thinking about it too much, I guess? Yes. So there's... There's, I think, multiple bits of advice I want to give for that. Uh, first and foremost, foremost, I'm going to post this link in the chat. When you're a fourth year, whenever you're applying to medical school, I want you to go ahead and watch this YouTube video. It's by Dr. Kevin Ahern. It is, uh, the first part is about 50 minutes long. The second part is about an hour and a half long. It is very, very good at explaining how to make yourself look as good as possible for the interview. He goes over a lot of fundamental points and concepts, not just for the interview, but how to really craft yourself into a mature adult that's gonna see people in their most vulnerable state as a physician. Okay, so that's the first bit of advice I wanna give for that. Um, the, next, the next bit of advice I'll probably give is I think, again, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself, so I'm trying to avoid repeating myself too much. But it's the whole idea, if you're confident in your application, if you're confident in your personal statement, if you're confident about all of the rec letters that you got, um, you'll build up that confidence where you're like, I know exactly why I'm here. I know exactly why they selected me for an interview. And I know exactly what I'm going to talk about because I'm mission-oriented, I'm goal-oriented, I know all I want to be a physician. So as you develop that sense over time, and I know I'm being very repetitive, you'll, get, you'll gain that confidence. And then once you get to the interview, the interview will be completely natural for you. The thing you really, and Dr. Uh, Ahern uh, talks about this, you really don't want to be that pre-med student that, sho that shows up to a medical school interview. It's just a nervous wreck. You don't want to be, oh, okay, yeah, I want to be a doctor. Yeah, I like caring for people. I want to, you don't want to be like that. And the way you can avoid that is making sure you're 100% sure about why, why you want to be a physician, okay? And there's a lot of subtle things you can do with your body language, the way you answer certain questions, which Dr. Ahern also talks about. Highly, highly recommend that uh, video um, to really give that point across, okay? Thank you. I hope that answers it. I'm, I'm kind of trying to answer these questions fast so we can get as many as we can. Any other questions? Does anyone else have any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, so, um, you know, with like Zoom University and everything being online, it's been kind of difficult 
um, building relationships with, with professors and lack of face-to-face -face interactions. So I was just wondering if you had any tips um, regarding like building uh, relationships for like good recommendation letters and such. Yeah, that's, that's honestly a difficult thing to ask because I've personally also been struggling with this, trying to find uh, mentors for me, uh, psychiatry mentors for me. Um, but I think the best bit of advice I can give to that is a lot of people, you know, attend these Zoom university meetings, leave your, leave your camera on, you just passively listening to the lectures, like all that stuff, right? If you're truly interested in the class and you really want to get to know the professor, leave your camera on, show up early, try to talk to them, send them more emails, see if you can send up one-on-one -on -one meetings as well. There's all these stuff you kind of have to adapt to because of the reality of our situation to get yourself known to these professors, to these physicians, whoever you can. You have to really be adaptive um, to what, what we're going through. Um, so it's kind of just staying engaged, staying positive, asking a lot of questions during, um, during, uh, during your lectures, that kind of stuff. It's, it's the very simple stuff that might build up over time and hopefully develop into very strong relationships with your professors, with your, with your mentors, with your physicians, whoever you might be talking to. Um, I know that that feels like a kind of a cop-out answer. It's not a really good answer, but it's kind of the reality I feel like all of us are in as of right now. No, that's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, it's just been difficult with all the all this, and then there's like shadowing, just lack of... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I definitely feel for you. <laughs> Okay, Natalie. Hey, Natalie. Do you have a question? No, we can't hear you, Natalie. I think she was having issues because I saw her unmute and her, like she was talking, but I couldn't hear anything. Well, again, I posted my email in the chat. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and take it down, feel free, to, feel free to send me an email. I'll probably respond with my phone number if you want to set a one-on-one -on -one email, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication in whatever way. Um, but are there any other last burning questions whatsoever? All right. Okay, it seems like that's about it. So everybody, y'all are free to go if you already signed in. Um, well, that's how we'll be taking attendance today. But uh, with that, thank you all so much for coming. I hope you all were able to get a lot out of this. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Hey, Sean, you said that you put your email on the group chat? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it one more time. Okay. I see a YouTube link, but that's it. There you go. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, do you have any like other um, ways of communication like LinkedIn or I know some other speakers have done like they have an Instagram page? Uh, I don't personally have an Instagram, but I believe if you search up my full name on LinkedIn, I do have a profile. I, I sometimes uh, uh, update it, but second year has been pretty... Uh, tiring for me, so I haven't found too many opportunities to necessarily update it. But yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Okay, thank you for your time. Sure I hope thing. you have a good uh, rest of your day. Mm -hmm. You too. Is that Adam? What's up, bro? Hey, what's up, man? Uh, Mark, this is my good friend Adam. He's at Mayo Clinic's Medical School. He's he's the one I talk about. All did you like the advice given in this video? Make sure to like and comment below what you've learned as well. Uh, hope to see y'all in the next video. Cheers.